It's not obligatory to celebrate Harvest Festival in churches. In the Old Testament, it was one of the three annual feasts which took the men to Jerusalem. And of course, we read Psalms, as we have done this morning, like Psalm 65, which give thanks to God for the way he cares for the world and provides the harvest. Harvest was once very, very relevant to us here in Shepshed, with great farming communities within and all around us. And I think today it can be argued that harvest is relevant for new reasons. We were up at Beacon Hill yesterday afternoon, and a double-decker bus from people presumably from the middle of Leicester had come out to the countryside. And it is said today, isn't it, that many youngsters from urban city centres have no idea where food comes from. They have no idea that a cow turns into beef and things like that. So it's good that we have this opportunity to remind people, but above that, it's a wonderful opportunity to encourage often a thankless people, aren't we, to give thanks to the Lord our God. Not only for this marvellous provision of food, but also that it is a provision of food as he promised. You can trust this God and his word. And we've already seen on the screen the promise from Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So today is also a reminder to us, a remembrance that God is faithful. And for believers, that's a reminder to us that he's faithful in everything, not just the harvest. He who has called you into fellowship with his Son is faithful faithful. He will complete the work he's begun in you. No one will ever pluck you out of his hand. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's faithful. And this morning we're remembering that all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So it's a harvest theme. Today's message, if you're following this sheet I've done for the youngsters, is all about harvest. And in the Bible, harvest is mentioned many times the actual celebration of it itself. The verse that we had earlier on from Acts chapter 14, when in a place called Lystra, Barnabas and Paul declare to the crowd that there is an unseen but living God. And he has not left the people without a testimony. He quotes, he's shown kindness. This is an evidence of God's kindness to us. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in the seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. This is a testimony to the God that we cannot see, but the one who's made himself known in the scriptures and he's telling us something in the harvest. And whereas the Bible recognises God's faithfulness in the physical harvest, The Bible often uses harvest imagery to teach us spiritual truths. Important we understand the difference. The Bible speaks of the real harvest, the physical harvest, and God's goodness to us in that. But then he uses imagery from that, which we all understand, to point to spiritual truths which we need to understand. So he speaks of a sowing, the seed going into the ground, And he talks about a reaping, a a judgment. And if you're at all familiar with the Bible, you'll know that Jesus uses this form of speech very often. There's the parable of the sower, isn't there? The farmer who goes into the the field, he's got his little bag of seed and he throws it out and it ends up on four different sorts of soil. And there's four different results. Out of the four, only one produces a lovely harvest. One looks like it's going to but doesn't. One does for a very short time and then it fades away and one there's nothing at all. And Jesus says, you understand that from the fields, don't you? But that's a picture of what happens when God's word is sown, when God's truth is spoken, it falls into different sorts of hearts and there's different responses. Can you see how Jesus uses the natural to point to the spiritual? Harvest is also a picture of final judgment. And it's very sober then, isn't it? I remember as a young kid being out in Gloucestershire and very frightened because the farmer had set fire to the field as they do when they brought the the wheat in and it got out of control and so there were 
blue lights, fire engines flashing down the Slab Valley. And I was frightened as a little kid. But it was very stark, wasn't it? The grain had been collected and put in the barn, and the rest was going to be burned. And the Bible actually uses that as an illustration of the coming judgment. The barning, if you like, of those who've repented of sin and believed in Jesus. And then the burning, the eternal punishment for those who continue to reject him. This morning we're looking at harvest and we're going to look at this little story in a sense that Jesus tells in verse 24. Verse 24, where he says these words... Most assuredly, I say to you, unless an ear of wheat, he could have said a grain of wheat, unless an ear of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit or much grain. One grain into the ground dies, produces much grain. And the question is, what's the point of that story? Well, it's a lesson of agriculture, isn't it, first of all? I guess we're familiar with it. There's a grain of wheat. You sow it into the ground and it dies and it produces much grain. I didn't understand this for quite some time, but in nature, I'm told, plants and seeds, life comes from death. The seed, the ear, the grain must be put into the ground where it rots, it decays, it decomposes and dies. It must do that if it's going to bear any fruit. Think about your sunflowers. There have been sunflowers everywhere, haven't there, this uh, summer? If you've got your sunflower seed and you kept it on the mantelpiece and you refused to bury it and you kept it without sowing it, your harvest is zero, isn't it? If it remains on the mantelpiece as a seed. But if you put it in the ground, it produces a harvest. You put it into the ground and it dies and it rots and there's life. There's no life without a death. That's the point that Jesus is making. But then he applies that to a spiritual truth to what we call his passion, which is his death. It's very clear that in these verses, Jesus is talking about his death. In the same way that a grain of wheat or an ear of wheat goes into the ground and dies, so Jesus of Nazareth is going to go into the ground and die. He's talking about his death. I'll show you in just a moment. But he's making the same point that his death is then going to produce a wonderful harvest. Many seeds, much grain. I hope you can see the parallel. Seed, much flowers. Jesus, a big harvest of what? Well, we'll come to that. But we know it's his death, because in verse 33 we read, this he said, signifying by what death he would die. In verse 32 it talks about him being lifted up. That's a reference to him being lifted up on the cross to die for you and for me. The whole point of this, what Jesus is narrowing in on, is that he is going to die, and from that death there's going to be an amazing harvest across the world. The one death is going to bring much life. The one grain will lead to many seeds. And of course, if we look round these verses, the chapters beforehand, verses before verse 10, it's clear he's going to die. They're plotting to kill him. And you probably know that after he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey, he's questioned by the religious authorities for three days. He washes the feet of his disciples. He eats the Lord's Supper with them. We're going to do that in just a few moments' time. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. You familiar with this? There he's betrayed by a kiss, isn't he, by Judas. And then this man who's done nothing wrong is arrested and whipped and stripped and beaten and ridiculed and mocked and falsely accused and tried and then nailed to a cross. He's lifted high. 
a crown of thorns upon his head. As he hangs there at the sixth hour, darkness covers the land for three hours. And then Jesus, we read, gave up his spirit, breathed his lust. And the centurion said, surely this man was the son of God. He apparently dies before the two either side of him. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, the two men who take his body down from the cross, wrap it in a linen cloth and put it in a grave. And at that point it looks very dismal, doesn't it? And it looks like a defeat. And yet Jesus is preparing people here that his death is actually going to lead to much life. A glorious harvest all over the world. And it's that wonderful truth that I really want you to consider this morning. The death of Jesus and what it produces and what it's produced in your life. I'm with you in that the death doesn't look very impressive, does it? And a seed being sown into the ground doesn't look very impressive. I'd much rather take my camera and see it being reaped than seeing the farmers sow the seed. Even I'm not sad enough to go and take photographs of that. But lying in a manger of Bethlehem, that looks pretty unimpressive too, isn't it? And this great teacher having nowhere to lay down his head, that doesn't look very impressive either, does it? But he's a seed here that goes into the ground and dies, and he's going to produce a magnificent harvest. So we've seen the story and its point. We've seen his passion. Next, I want to look at his purpose. I want you to understand that Jesus dying on the cross 2,000 years ago wasn't an accident, wasn't a mistake. It was the very purpose of which he came from heaven. Just as with the, the farmer, the farmer's got a purpose, hasn't he? His job is to grow food, and to achieve that goal, he sows the seed. That's the purpose. My purpose is to sow seed and to raise a harvest. Well, for Jesus to achieve his goal, he has to die, and that is the very purpose of which he comes, as we see in verse 27. He says there, for this purpose, I came to this hour. This death is what I'm all about. It's not an accident. It's not a plan B. It's why I'm here. I didn't come to earth in a sense to be born, though I had to be. I didn't come purely to teach. I didn't come to do signs. I didn't visit earth to be nothing more than an example of love. They're all very important things, but they support the main thing, which is that I've come to die. This is my purpose. That's why the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, spend so long, not in the first 33 years of Jesus' life, but in the last week. I mean, Matthew takes up 40% of what he's saying with the last week. Mark, 60%. Luke, 30. John here, we're halfway through. And we're already into Jesus' last week. You see, you'll never really understand Jesus unless you understand his death. He came to produce a harvest, a harvest that can only be produced by him dying. The Bible simply says he came into the world to save sinners like me and like you. The death is central. It's his purpose. Next thing I want you to notice is that this is a plan that he's working to. It's as though there are dates in the diary and he's just following that plan, that scheme. How do we know that? Well, let's go back to the farmer. The farmer has a plan, doesn't he? He doesn't get up and think, oh, I'm going to put some seed in the ground today. He knows precisely when to sow the seed. And he knows precisely the time of year and the conditions to reap that seed. He's working to a plan. Just as I guess some of you do in your garden. Can't help but notice the lovely chrysanthemums down at Charles's again this year. He, he works to a plan, doesn't he? 
He knows what he's doing on day 47 and day 51, and it's a great plan. Well, here, the grain of wheat falls to the ground at a precise time. How do you know? Because verse 23, Jesus says, the hour has come. It's been coming, it's been spoken about, but now it's arrived. And again, if you looked at the verses around this, chapter 13, verses 1 and 31, even into chapter 16, we read, the hour has come. It's now. There's a plan, there's a script. It's his purpose worked down to the very minute. Earlier on in John's Gospel, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. In John chapter 8, we read, no one laid hands on him because his hour hadn't come. But in the book, there was an hour when it did come, and, and this is it. And the amazing thing that the Bible makes known to us is that this plan was planned before time began. When only God existed. Because Jesus is a lamb who's slain, he's going to die as a sacrifice, and the Bible says from before the foundation of the world. His death is spoken about in the third chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. It's spoken of in Isaiah chapter 53, the purpose of him dying. Psalm 22 figures him there, pierced on the cross. Hundreds of years before he was born, there's a plan. God has revealed that he's going to send somebody in whom there would be forgiveness of sin and everlasting life for all who would turn to him. Such that when Jesus dies, Peter's then able to say, well, he died according to God's set purpose and foreknowledge. It was a plan. The clock was ticking. It wasn't time, and now it is time. The Apostle Paul, in his letters later on, says, at just the right time. Elsewhere, he says, when the time had fully come. Jesus was working to a plan. It's no accident, no mistake. Jesus tells this little story about a grain that goes into the ground and dies and produces much fruit. The point is to speak of his death, which is the very purpose of which in love he came for the likes of me and you. It was planned from the beginning of time and then we notice something very special about the timing. Because it happens at the feast. And that's not a coincidence. That's not by chance. It's the feast. And it's fascinating that when the Gentiles come to the feast and say, we want to see Jesus, that's the sign. Jesus says, the hour has come. Now, Gentiles want to see him, and the hour has come. But it's the feast of Passover. There were three annual feasts, and one was Passover. It's mentioned in chapter 12 and verse 1, chapter 12 and verse 20, chapter 13 and verse 1, and here in verse 20, the Gentiles arrive at the feast. The death of Jesus of Nazareth was timed to be at the hour of Passover. Well, what on earth was Passover? Well, I understand what the Pentecost Thanksgiving was. That's a harvest festival. But what was Passover in celebration of? Well, very, very quickly. Passover commemorated, remembered, the days when the Israelites once had been slaves in the land of Egypt. God had taken them down there. They'd been brutalized. They've been told to make bricks even without straw. They've been asked to up their allocation of bricks and they groaned to God and he heard them. And to show to Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, that God really was God, God sent ten miracles, ten signs, ten wonders. And the last one was Passover. Passover. And Passover was about God judging those who refused to accept who he was and stood against his purposes and wouldn't let the Israelites go. 
And Passover involved taking a lamb and putting that lamb that had to be perfect to death. And then you took the blood from that lamb, which had died, and you put it around your door frame and your lintel. And so if you'd gone through the land, you'd have seen that some houses had blood, the blood of lambs around the door frames and the lintel. They believed God, they trusted God, so that's what they did. And God says that when the angel of death passed through in judgment, when he saw the blood, he passed over. He let that home live. But where he didn't see the blood, where people hadn't believed God and done what he told them to do, the firstborn was put to death as a judgment. And so that was Passover. And every year the Jews went up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, their great freedom from the slavery to Egypt, all through a Passover lamb that died and the blood was put around their home. And if you're ahead of me, you'll have seen the glorious parallel. To set us free, not from Egyptian slavery, but to set us free from our slavery to sin and the penalty that we deserve all of us to face, Jesus, God's Son, comes from heaven as a man to shed his blood as a lamb of sacrifice. The earlier lambs pointed to the real one who was coming. The real one was Jesus, who so loved his undeserving people that he died for them. And a Christian today is simply somebody who's effectively seen the blood of Jesus applied to their life. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he can make me right with God. Only he can give me forgiveness of sins. I trust not in me being religious or good, because I'm not. I trust in him and the blood that he shed for me because he loved me. It's a marvellous plan, isn't it? And he dies at twilight as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He dies that others who will believe in him will live. And so on that cross he dies in our place, bearing our sin, facing God's anger against that sin. And if we've trusted in Jesus, we believe in him and who he is, and that in him there's forgiveness of our sins. We've got the blood of Jesus, as it were, covering our lives. So Jesus tells a little story, and it points to his death, going into the ground and dying. The very purpose of which he came, according to a plan, and he dies at Passover as a sacrifice for sin. And the last thing is, well, what did this death produce? What did this seeming defeat produce? A bumper harvest. An absolute glorious crop. Because he died, but you know the story, he rose. They got to that same tomb on the third day, and the angel said, he's not here, he's risen as his appearances then over the next 40 days proved, and as the apostles then preached. And what was produced from his death and resurrection? A bumper harvest. One of what? Carrots? Grapes? No. What was produced? Followers of Christ. Disciples. Christians. In their multitude. Souls who came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ all over the world were produced by his death. A people who follow him, being changed more and more into his likeness, who when they leave this world will go to be with him forever. You know at Easter he rose from the dead. That's described as a first fruits of the harvest. You see, his death produces a harvest and he's the first evidence, the first 
part of the crop that rises. But seven weeks later, at another annual feast of Pentecost, which was the harvest celebration, Jesus is now in heaven. He pours out the Holy Spirit. 3,000 souls come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They turn from their sin. They believe in him. And as you go through the Bible, on and on, on and on in the Acts of the Apostles, the word of God goes out. People believe, people believe, people believe. There's many who don't. There's many who do. And it's the bumper harvest. Those for whom Christ died, who will come to believe in him and follow him. And it's the same today. It's amazing, isn't it? If I put a seed in the ground tomorrow, the harvest might be a few weeks, a few months. But there's a seed that went into the ground 2,000 years ago which is still producing a harvest today. Because there are still men, women, children, young people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a harvest of souls continuing to be converted And when the last one is converted, Christ will come again for the final harvest. The barning and the burning. A day that you and I will experience. A drawing together of everybody who's ever lived from which we won't escape. A division into two which we'll encounter, not the good and the bad, the religious and the irreligious, but those who've trusted in Christ and those who haven't. And then there's an eternal destiny, either of heaven or of hell. And this harvest is going on today in every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In another parable, Jesus speaks of it being like a wedding hall and it's full. It's full. A bumper harvest of souls who are forgiven and who possess everlasting life. That's why Jesus came. And that's what he's achieved through him being like a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies, producing many seeds, a death of immeasurable love. And so to close, How do we respond? Well, Jesus clearly says that his death is a pattern. Verse 25. If we love our lives, owning our lives and living lives in the way that we want to live them without Christ, then he says we'll lose our lives. Love your life. See, it as your life for you to live how you want to live without reference to the God who made you, who's been so good to you, you'll lose it, and in the final harvest, you'll be in the bundle for burning. But if you renounce ownership of your life, abandon your claims of goodness and follow Christ, if you seek his forgiveness and reconciliation, you'll have eternal life. Jesus sets here, as we've seen so often in Mark, to which we will one day return, the pattern of discipleship. It's about dying to self and living to Jesus. He who would be saved from their sins must be ready to give up their life in order to know Christ. This love demands my soul, my life, my all. A grain of wheat, much fruit in terms of many Christians, and in them, much Christ-likeness, of which more tonight at six o'clock. A grain of wheat that in love dies to produce a bumper cross crop of eternal life. The death of Jesus, purposeful, planned, a Passover. Will you pass it by this morning? Or will you come to participate in this harvest? 
and come to be part of the bumper crop simply by turning from your sin and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you and to forgive you your sin. Which will it be? A participant? Or merely a spectator who walks away and passes by?